Our speaker today is Brian Kemp, who's our Secretary of State of Georgia. I've known Brian, I guess, gosh, probably eight or nine years at least. And he got elected, he went into office about four years ago. Now you gotta understand, I've worked with Small Business Administration, worked with Chambers, and dealt with a lot of small businesses. Brian came in and turned the whole Secretary of State's office around. Not that it was a bad office before, but he made it user friendly. He made it small business friendly. He did away with the red tape. But what made Brian even more unique was, times I talked to him, he wanted to help <laughs> the veterans and their challenges of going into small business or starting a small business or working with a small business. And his heart has been there, not only to help everybody, but to help the veterans and help us. And this is a guy that, I, I, as a lot of you know, I've done a lot of campaigns and elections over the years, both Republican and Democrat. But this is a guy that you want to help. He's a friend to us. He's anytime you have a problem, Brian will be there. Um, he's got a, 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 a uh, assistant Jared um, Thomas. Thomas, who's another one there that can help us out. But this man is veteran friendly, and that's what it's all about. And he is doing everything he can to break away the red tape and the challenges that we sometimes had and the frustrations that we go through. And a lot of small business people I've worked with that have told me that you know the time we started this five years ago, eight years ago, today it's nothing. They have made it smooth to get it through. So I want you to give a big welcome to Brian Kemp, our Secretary of State of Georgia. Thank you very much, Pat. If I'd have been pulling numbers, I'd have pulled yours. <laughs> I also want to thank Kirk for having me today. I, I was uh, fortunate enough to get to come visit with this group, I, I guess it was a couple of months ago for one of, for one of your meetings, and uh, it's just great to see the camaraderie that you all have and, and, and certainly appreciate what the association's doing. I want to tell you a real quick story before I talk about a couple of things that, that have to do with the military and, and veterans. Uh, last Christmas, my wife and I, we have three daughters. They're 14, 13, and, and 11 right now. But last Christmas, we decided that we were going to get involved in the, uh, an Adopt-a-Soldier program that's going on, uh, I think, mainly down in Savannah. I'm sure it's probably all over. But um, I, I read an article in the Athens paper about this lady down there who's helping support the troops that are overseas, uh, mainly in Afghanistan and Iraq. And she was explaining in this article how you can go get these one, one size boxes that you just pay one fee to ship them over, you fill them up with a bunch of good stuff and send them over to the troops. I thought that would be a great, uh, a great thing for us to do as a family, a great project to help you know, my kids understand what Christmas is really about, about giving something to, to somebody who's given a lot to us. So, uh, we enjoyed that so much, you know, a family shopping trip at Sam's that cost twice as much as it should have because we had the kids with us. <laughs> but, I mean, we're, we're trying to figure out what to get, you know, things that will hold up shipping that far, you know, hard candy and beef jerky and, you know, I, I'm wanting to buy chewing tobacco to put in there and they won't let me, you know, things like that. <laughs> But anyway, we fixed some great boxes. Well, we, we had such a good time doing that and just got so much great appreciation ourselves from it. We, we decided to do it again. And uh, I got home last night and I got this letter in the mail. I want to read it to you. It's from SPC uh, Omar Mitchell. He said, hopefully my letter reaches you before Christmas, but if not, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I can't begin to tell you how happy uh, myself and my team were to receive your package. We all cheered like we had won the Super Bowl. Your gift not only brightened my day, but also the members of my company, of which uh, it is many of their first time being away from home. Although it's not much, please accept this letter as a token of my appreciation. Also enclosed, enclosed is my section's fires insignia. It is an honor to serve you and your family and the people of this great, great nation. 
please let me know that you've received this letter, which I will do. But I know that uh, probably most of you in this room have been over serving this country uh, during the holidays, and I just want to tell you I appreciate your service and all that you have done, and uh, I, I really truly mean that. And I hope if I can ever be of service to you in the Secretary of State's office, you'll let me know. Um, I wanted to quickly just say a couple of things about what we do in the office, just so you have a sense of, of who we are in the Secretary of State's office. Most people just associate us with elections and that's it. Uh, they don't realize that we do a lot of other things. We probably uh, interact with as many Georgians on any given day as just about any uh, state agency that there is, uh, being that we do uh, administer elections. I'm the chief elections official for the state of Georgia. Uh, part of that job description is we house the state's voter registration system, so we're the ones that are in charge of making sure that you know we have an accessible uh, voter registration system, but also making sure that it's secure so that we have fair uh, elections in the state, and that's a big part of what we do in all the counties and the cities and everybody else that's holding elections. They rely on that, that database when we have voting going on. We also do the training for the counties and the cities to make sure that they're following uh, all the rules and, and laws of state elections uh, to make sure that things are properly done. And we do a lot of training as well to make sure that they know what to do. Uh, also chair the state elections board, um, which has oversight over those laws and rules. And a lot of people don't realize it, but we have our own police agency in the Secretary of State's office. We've got almost 20 post-certified investigators, many of them old uh, law enforcement, some veterans uh, that, are, that are working the second go-round in the Secretary of State's office doing that investigative work, uh, and it's very important. But a lot of people don't even, even realize that. Uh, we also register all corporations in the states. I know many of you are business owners or work for different uh, corporations. We do that. By the way, your annual renewal period has opened up, so don't forget to pay on time. <laughs> because uh, if you don't, we will fine you an extra $25, and uh, the, the, the legislature doesn't need that money. They're taking it away from us anyway, so I don't want you guys to have to, have to pay for it. And, and people are always asking me, so, well, why would you raise our fees a couple years ago? We, we only collect the fees. We don't decide how much they are, so don't blame me on that. <laughs> uh, but we do uh, register all corporations. But if, I, if you ever have any trouble... Uh, in regards to that, just let Pat know or uh, anybody in this room that does have my contact info will be glad to help you, help you out with that. We also regula regulate securities in the state, so any uh, you know, stockbrokers, financial advisors, broker dealers, those kind of things, we, uh, we regulate those. Uh, you know, everybody's heard of the Dodd-Frank legislation, right? Well, this is, you, you guys will get a good appreciation of this. This is typical of the federal government. But when that passed, we got more to do. So we used to we used to regulate any portfolios under 25 million. Now we regulate portfolios under 100 million, and of course we've got no new resources to do that with. Has that ever happened to you guys? We didn't talk, sir. <laughs> and then the last thing we do is uh, professional licensing. So we have about a half a million Georgians that have to have a basically have to have a license or a piece of paper from the Secretary of State's office. We do the administrative work of over 40 licensing boards, and uh, that office is in Macon, Georgia. It's a, it's a you know, huge undertaking getting all those different people licensed. There's 200 different types of prof professions that we're dealing with. There's a, a two-year renewal period, so we'll do about half the, the state this year and, and the other half next year. And it's anything you can imagine. It goes from accountants to wastewater treatment operators and everything in between. A lot of different uh, professions like veterinarians, um, you know, a lot of healthcare people like nurses, physical therapists, a lot of trades um, like contractors, electricians, plumbers. I mean, anything that, that you can think of that's licensed, we, we take care of that. So that's what we do. A couple of issues that I thought would be uh, pertinent to this group You'll be proud to know that um, Georgia was one of the first states in the country to pass the Military Overseas Voting Empowerment Act uh, on a state level. That was off of uh, some federal legislation that uh, my good friend Saxby Chambliss worked on to make sure that you know, we're finding ways as, as a country and as states to make sure that our folks that are serving overseas 
not only our people serving in the military or the armed services, uh, but our but our citizens that are over, you know, spouses, uh, other agents that are over there have the opportunity to take part in our elections. But when I first got in office in 2010, our main priority that legislative session was to get that passed. And we were one of the first states to do it. We were also one of the first states to implement the electronic ballot delivery. Uh, so now we have the ability in Georgia through our My Voter page where we can actually email ballots overseas, whereas before the county was having to mail ballots, uh, that person serving or, or the overseas voter would have to fill that ballot out then mail it back. And a lot of times you couldn't get that done uh, in six weeks. And if the ballot was here late, then it wouldn't get counted, which is absolutely uh, ridiculous. So we wanted to be on the forefront of getting electronic ballot delivery. So now people that are serving overseas, all they have to do is request an absentee ballot, which you can do through our, uh, our website or the county's website. Just ch check the box that says you want electronic ballot delivery. And once that ballot's built and ready, we'll send an email notification to the individual letting them know that. They go to our My Voter page, put their individualized information in, that pops up and they have a place where they can actually print their ballot out. It's got a Uacava watermark on the ballot. They simply print it out, fill it out, and then mail it back. So basically we're cutting, in, t cutting the time in half for absentee balloting for, for military and overseas voters. And we were one of the first states in the country uh, to do that. In the last uh, election cycle, the presidential race, uh, I think we had about 20,000 military ballots that came back and were counted in Georgia. And to my knowledge, there were none that, that we received that didn't meet the deadline to be counted. So we were very proud of that fact. Uh, and we're also very proud that the legislature has been so supportive of, of that project and other things that we're looking to do uh, in the future to continue to be on the forefront of that. And there's a lot that's going on uh, across the country. One of the things that I will tell you that concerns me a little bit, um, sometimes the, the Justice Department and the federal government will hold states accountable for military ballots not getting out, but it's really the responsibility of the counties to send those ballots. So we're constantly working with the counties, making sure that they know the deadlines and that they meet the deadlines. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes a state will get sued because the county's not doing things the proper way. So that's a that's something that we got to continue to work on from a training aspect here in Georgia. Uh, but I think on the other end, too, we also need to make sure that the federal government and the military itself, quite honestly, is making sure that there's access on the other end. You know, there's always a lot of fingers pointed to the state saying, hey, you need to do this, this, and this. But if the, if the access on the other end, the overseas end, when you got, you know, folks that are on the ground away from base camp, you know, how, how do they get back to be able to, to vote or to get ballots to them uh, to make that happen? And that's something that's, that's always going to be an issue, but something that I think we always need to continue to remember and continue to keep working on. We're certainly committed to doing that. Something else that we worked with uh, in the last year or so with uh, Governor Deal that was one of his priorities and our office was very involved with it was to try to help a lot of these returning veterans that are coming back into the state now, coming off of uh, tours of duty and service, um, that, that want a job, that are ready to work. You know, we need them in our workforce. We have areas, believe it or not, even in these uh, high uh, unemployment times, there's certain fields where there's jobs there that we can't fill. Uh, a lot of those are licensed professions that we do through the Secretary of State's office, uh, like the trades. And one of the governor's priorities last legislative session was to figure out a way to help those veterans coming back to get them licensed quicker if they had had that type training in the military. So instead of them having to go through additional courses or testing or what have you, uh, it, there were parameters that were put into the law and the rules that were made to go along with that where they could actually just give proof of that to us and then they would receive their professional license and wouldn't have to go through uh, the bureaucratic red tape of, of what you know other licensees are doing because they've already had that training and that's been documented through their military service. So 
we were real involved as the legislation went through helping craft the language and, and work with the governor's team on that and the legislature. And then once the bill passed, we had to work with them on, you know, how do we set this process up uh, as far as people, you know, requesting that license through the Secretary of State's office, uh, working with the governor's office of workforce development to make sure that that happens. And uh, we, we we're proud to, to have been able to do that, and I will tell you that that's going very well. Um, you know, we've completed that process and are now ready to go to help these folks that are coming back. It's time for us to give something back for what they've given to us. And I know y'all have heard a lot of speeches from a lot of politicians, so I'm not going to go on and, and let you hear a bunch of that, but I just want to tell you in closing that uh, I sincerely appreciate your service. I appreciate the support that you're giving through this organization to others, and uh, I'm very impressed with, the, impressed with this organization, and I hope that if I can ever help any of you all, whether it's a corporations issue, elections, licensing, uh, whatever, I hope you'll call us. I, I don't think you'll find um, a better office in state government about constituent services and and us reacting to try to help people if we can. And if we can't help you, we'll be straight up and tell you we can't. You know, that's just how we, how we roll, as they say. But Happy New Year. God bless you. Thank you for what you do. And I'm glad to answer any questions if we have time. And if we don't, uh, appreciate y'all having me. Anyone uh, have a question? Please stand up. Jeff? You mentioned on the uh, absentee ballots. Uh, it seems that we are more and more into an electronic age, I can file my taxes electronically without ever having to print out a document. Is there a move in the Secretary's office, in your office, to eliminate the necessity for snail mail on the return again? Yeah, one of the things, you know, there's, there's some uh, states that have done some pilot projects with, you know, basically what you would call internet voting. Now, I am not on the, the side of advocating for internet voting right now because I don't think we have the, the security uh, in place to do that. That's not to say that there couldn't be a great benefit for the military for that. Uh, one of the pilot projects we actually looked at where I think they did some of that, um, you know, I think it went pretty well, but it was very expensive. It cost like $3,700 a vote which you can imagine that's, you know, yeah, yeah just, when I was in the legislature, we made slightly more than that for a whole year, you know, but um, so, I mean, that, that's certainly a concern, but I think that that problem will be addressed over the years, but it's mainly the, the security part of it. The other part of it is, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. So there's been some states that have tried to do that. And then they actually got sued saying, well, if you're going to do that for the military, you got to do that for everybody. And if we had to do that for everybody, that would be a big, con big concern from having secure elections. So I don't think we're quite there yet, but there's other countries that are doing things like that. And I think the technology, you know, in five years, it may be a whole different story. There may be a whole different way to, to figure out how to do that where it can be secure. And I would certainly be you know, one that would that would want to look at all options because you could, I think, reduce a lot of costs, but you could also provide, you know, even a more instantaneous <coughs> ballot. And Pat and I have been discussing other options too for military voting that that may be more efficient as well. So we're we're continuing to look at that. Sure, Don, could you uh, clarify uh, a little bit about the voter ID? We keep reading stuff. Uh, nationally and locally, and I, I'm confused on what's legal and what's not legal. Well, I get confused on a lot of things that come out of the Justice Department myself these days. <laughs> that, that's just my opinion. Um, but I, I wouldn't worry too much about about the things that we have done here in Georgia to make sure that we have secure elections, and that's what it's all about. Uh, I'm a firm believer that the states should be administering elections, you know, the states and the counties and the cities. We don't need the federal government trying to tell states how to run elections. And, and I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of the photo ID law. You know, I voted for that when I was in the Senate. We've uh, defended that successfully against all lawsuits. Um, and, and we don't have any issues with that in Georgia. It's other states that are now passing these same type laws. 
because they want to do the same thing that Georgia's doing, make sure that their elections are secure, uh, that they're now getting sued by the Justice Department. And I think at the end of the day, they'll all prevail because the precedent is there that it, it's not a violation of the Constitution to make sure that we know who somebody is when they come vote. You know, the same crowd in Washington that's saying you can't do that for elections, you know, I'm saying, well, you're going to let me not do that when I go to the airport and go through security? No, they're not. You know, it's, it's something that the state has decided to do. But that being said, I do believe it's up to the states. You know, if Texas and Georgia and South Carolina, they want to have photo ID, they should be able to do that. But, you know, I know some of the Secretary of State's you know, in Minnesota and, and Vermont and other places, they're never going to have that, you know. And uh, that's certainly the way their state wants to run their and I, I respect that. But um, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. And I, I'll tell you that when I voted for that legislation, you know, it was a very contentiously debated issue. Uh, you know, a lot of racial tones to it as well, saying this is all about voter suppression you know, which I totally disagree with, because when you look at the numbers in Georgia, when you compare 04 to 08, and you compare uh, 2006 to 2010 elections, minority participation, African American and uh, Latino, both went out the roof. The participation numbers went out the roof with photo ID compared to when we didn't have it. So there's, you know, it's not keeping anybody from voting. It's not disenfranchising anyone. And the people that are pushing it are truly making sure that the ballots um, are secure. Uh, so I, I think that's something that, that often gets played up in the media, but it's a lot bigger story than what really is on the ground. Because in, you know, going back home to my 50-50 Senate district after that vote, I maybe heard from one or two people. Uh, and then after campaigning statewide, you know, when I ran for Secretary of State, I visited every county in Georgia uh, in the last three years. I mean, I hardly ever get asked about photo ID other than what people are hearing nationally. I mean, uh, nobody's coming up saying, you know, why, why do you have to do that? I mean, they all think it's pretty common sense that you should do it to keep the election secure. And certainly Georgians feel that way. I think it polls it you know, 70, high 70s, low 80, 80% 80 uh, of approval. So. Seems like we have an awful lot of professions that are licensed, like barbers and jail operators, uh, builders or something like this. Why can't we let the marketplace decide whether or not these people are competent to do their job? Why do we have to have a state license, a school, et cetera, et cetera, to do these kind of things? Do you have anything that can be used? Well, <laughs> yeah, I've been kind of fighting that fight here the last uh, the last four years, uh, and I certainly uh, agree with you. I think a lot of the professions would disagree with you when you talk to them. They all think that they are vital, and I, I certainly understand that. But but make no mistake, you know, some of these professions were created to create monopolies and reduce competition. I mean, even President Obama's. Uh, economist says so. And uh, I, I think that the longer it goes, the more that seems to, to take place. We have been um, fighting very hard to make sure that, that we are cutting that red tape, that we're providing access. I had a, a huge piece of legislation. It's probably one of the biggest pieces of legislation that's ever been introduced uh, underneath the Gold Dome to help revamp the whole licensing thing, to streamline it, to really take a lot of the politics out of it, to put the decisions in, in, in the hands of a citizen's board instead of a board of, of the peers of that license. And that thing, I, I mean, I got my you-know-what handed to me. But, I mean, I was doing it for the right rate reasons because I ran on streamlining government. Uh, I ran on making government more efficient. Uh, we had had at the time about a 30% you know, over the years, 30% 30 30 worth of budget cuts. We lost about 40% of our employees in the Secretary of State's office, and we were just getting killed. I mean, it was taking us, you know, 30 to 60 days to license somebody. So you get a nurse that graduates, she's ready to go to work, she's got a job, the hospital or the doctor's office needs that person the next week to start work. And we're having to tell them they're going to have to wait, you know, another seven weeks or so to get that piece of paper before they can do that. 
and that's just not what we should be doing. That's not that's not making us any more uh, competitive. But all those different professions, they have a lot of heavyweight people lobbying for them uh, at the Capitol. So it's a big uh, it's a big battle to fight. But even since losing that. Uh, and it's not that we don't feel like these professions are valid and in, in, in that, that, but there are some, I think, that we could streamline. Last, uh, last year, well, let's see, yeah, last year we were successful in combining two of the nursing boards. So we're now having, you know, half the meetings that we were having before. We've been able to designate the staff time that it takes for some of those two and three day meetings, you know, once a month or once every mo other month, having them doing other things. And we're looking uh, to other boards to do those same type things. So we're continuing to, to figure out ways to be more uh, efficient. But, but the whole question of whether we should license something or not is really one that the legislature has to take up. I know that your office doesn't quote regulate it, but from your perspective, could you comment on the future of ethics legislation in the state? <laughs> Are we out of time yet? <laughs> no, uh, I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you my, my thoughts on ethics. You know, um, I used to get blamed for all that because it did used to be in the Secretary of State's office. So years ago, when they created this separate agency, uh, which is what is called an attached agency, up until recently, the money flew through our budget. So when all the local officials are trying to file their reports and they can't get their PIN number to go online and do it, they're all calling me going, what is going on down there? Nobody will answer the phone. And I'm like, look, I have nothing to do with that. Well, they're like, well, it's on your website. And I was like, well, all the, the money just flows from me to them and we don't have any oversight of them. But, uh, you know, the legislature's tried to make some changes over there. Uh, it, it's been a little bit of an up and down situation with all that's going on now. And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what, you know, what's going to happen over there. I know it's frustrating for me because we get a lot of calls, but it's frustrating for me as a candidate. I mean, last year we had one of the reports that we were having to fill out on our personal financial disclosure that we have to do. And, um, you know, I couldn't take my report that we did the time before and just make changes to it. I had to start the whole thing over. Well, for a, a small business owner like myself that at times we've had to file you know, 12 to 15 different tax returns for different entities that we had in different businesses. I mean, it was a nightmare for the lady that was helping me with that. And, and that was, you know, you can imagine how many other candidates, people that serve on boards and other things have to do. So uh, I, know it's, I know it's very frustrating, but I, I don't really know. You know, there's been some talk about ethics legislation this year. If I had to bet, I would bet nothing would happen because it's going to be a very short, short session. And I think people spent a lot of time uh, the last session trying to get a bill that everybody could live with. And I think they'll want to see that, you know, work for a year or two before they try to go back and make changes. I, I personally believe sometimes government doesn't let things work enough. You know, we're always, you know, quick to change something, change it again next year. And, Nobody can ever really see how it's doing and measure it. So I, I think that's what they'll do on that. Right, one last question. Yes, sir. Is there anything down the pipeline in trying to do away with the annual fee for a 501c nonprofit organization? Well, that, that would certainly be something the legislature would have to weigh in, too. I have not heard that. Um, you know, the, the fees, a lot of people get frustrated with us when we can't answer the phone call or give help quickly enough. But the way this thing works is the fees go in. We collect the fee, but we have to, to send that to the, to the general treasury, to the Department of Revenue. We don't keep the fees. We just, we just are the collectors of them. So over the years, you know, corporation fees have gotten raised, and so people are paying in more money, and we actually have less money to do our job with than we had, you know, back in 2008. So it's kind of frustrating for me. I have not heard that about the uh, about the nonprofits. Now I know one of the, uh, the the tax packages that the governor and the Georgia Chamber of Commerce and I've been part of the governor's competitiveness initiative the last couple of years. Uh, one of the things that that may get passed this year I'm hearing is to there was an exemption for like the food banks. You know when they were taking I'm not sure if it was when they were buying food or taking 
there was some sort of fee or tax that they were having to pay that's really hurt uh, their bottom line, and I'm, I'm hearing that they may look at that to try to go back to the way it was before that would really help out a lot of the regional food banks around Atlanta Food Bank that really do tremendous work trying to help those less fortunate in the state. Okay. Very good. All right, thank you for having me. Ryan, thank you. On behalf of the membership, we'd like to present you with a replica of our Vietnam Service Medal. You can display this uh, as either a paperweight, but I've been told by the people that have this in their office, if it is displayed properly and prominently, it helps with your negotiations with the state legislature wow. and also <laughs> significantly, it significantly increases your political career. Okay? <laughs> we may replace the state seal with this. <laughs> And Brian, uh, just for y'all, thank you again. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but he attended our uh, memorial dedication in Conyers a few years ago, and thank you for coming to that. And you are welcome to any meeting or any of our dedications here in the future.